All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Welcome, Fiona. I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to do this conversation. I'm Matt Rajansky, uh, director of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute, uh, joined today for a very timely conversation. But, you know, when is talking about Russia and Putin ever not timely with the incomparable Dr. Fiona Hill? Um, before we start, I want to remind everybody who's tuning in uh, that you can stay up to date with all of our upcoming events, podcasts, publications, and more. Uh, on our website uh, at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, and in particular, I want to invite you to give a listen to our Kenan X podcast, a reference, of course, to the X article, uh, and our newest podcast, The Russia File. Um, let me just remind everybody that throughout the conversation, and we've already gotten quite a few of them, you can submit questions by email to kenan at wilsoncenter.org uh, via our Twitter and Facebook pages. And please do include your name and affiliation, just as if you were attending a live event at the Wilson Center, uh, which I hope we can do again soon. I'd be more likely to call on you uh, if you're not an anonymous blurred out face. So uh, I'm joined today by Dr. Fiona Hill, who is a senior fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe at, uh, in the Foreign Policy Program of the Brookings Institution. And of course, as everyone will know, served recently as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council. Uh, that was 2017 to, to 19. From 2006 to 2009, she also served as National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council and is co-author of the very uh, well-received and widely uh, read book, Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, uh, 2015 update. Uh, of a, a previously published book, but also I want to note, and that was with Cliff Gaddy, uh, and I, I want to note also the two of them authored The Siberian Curse, also I think a very uh, useful piece still for those of us thinking about Russia's uh, development and infrastructure challenges, because those problems haven't gone away. Um, Fiona, I want to open it up right away and ask you what I think is the central question. I think you and I agree on the difficulty of this, um, but it's, it's why. Why is it so hard to talk about Russia and U.S.-Russia relations in what we might consider to be a, a productive way, uh, especially here in Washington? Well, I mean, the obvious answer is because of <clears throat> what happened in 2016 in terms of the Russian um, operation to try to interfere and influence in the elections, which of course came across the backdrop of a highly contentious uh, presidential election campaign, extreme polarization in our own political system, and you know a lot of partisan divides. <clears throat> so although you know what Russia did in 2016 um, in terms of scale uh, wasn't that considerable, um, it had a much larger amplified impact than I think even the Russians um, anticipated. And certainly, um, you know, we ourselves had a failure of imagination to think that some of the things that Russia did in the US, which are no different from um, operations, active measures, influence operations, disinformation operations that they've carried out in other places going back all the way through the Cold War and even back to the Tsarist era. I mean, this is kind of, you know, something that the Russian intelligence services have just done as a matter of course and certainly think that this is kind of fair game in, you know, the, the larger overall scheme of things. I think even they're scratching their heads about the impact uh, and the scale of the impact that they had that we had the fear of imagination to think that what had worked in a sort of a Moldova or a Ukraine or Georgia or you know, somewhere else would have um, an impact here. And it was because we were uniquely vulnerable in that period, uh, given the nature of our domestic politics. And so as a result of that, Russia has become a factor in our domestic politics. It's the subject of endless conspiracy theories. Um, it's um, you know the subject of endless congressional hearings. Everything is still going on now. We're still trying to unpack what happened in 2016. And a lot of what happened is, is on us, is on our own you know, sets of interactions. And as a result, we can't take Russia out of that complexity and you know, put it to one side in the way that we really should do to uh, assess you know, where do we want this set of interactions with Russia to go. It's high time we did that. We can't keep living in this frame of 2016 forever. And Russia itself is still convinced. I've been having you know, interactions in various working groups with Russian colleagues 
that the relationship between the United States and Russia was still framed in some kind of geopolitical competition. And I think for most of um, the people engaged at the Kennan Institute, the Woodrow Wilson Center, and the think tanks, you know, around the, the US, as well as, you know, many people just watching this, why are we still in, you know, this frame of a geopolitical competition with Russia? The systemic struggle has gone, you know, we're not um, in, the, in the business of trying to carve up Europe, you know, um, uh, between ourselves, as you know, we might have been at the end of World War II. Um, you know, the transatlantic alliance itself has been grappling with all these different transnational threats. And, you know, I think we're just having a really hard time having that conversation about Russia because of, of this, uh, these pre-existing frames. So it's high time we do that. And, you know, th now is as good as, as any time, honestly, with, you know, the 2020 election appearing uh, on the horizon very quickly. But then, you know, what happens after that? In effect, I think what I'm hearing you say uh, is something I've, I've thought this for a long time as well. Um, essentially, that there's uh, an instrument that's that's always available to an adversary. In this case, it's Russia uh, or an interlocutor. Let's just say. Uh, in this case, it's Russia, but it, it could be almost anyone else. Which is, uh, if you can drag participants or um, competitors in the uh, messy, chaotic. Uh, you know, very high stakes American political landscape into your issue, then in effect, you may be able to swing the way your issue goes on the international level, on the level of diplomacy and negotiation. So it, in effect, it sort of is an open invitation, as long as we continue to show that this works, to any partner or adversary to, to jump into the American side of the equation and basically try to I mean, it would be a rational thing for them to do, right? To conclude going forward that this works. Well, that's the risk. It's a risk that other people see, hey, this is a great, you know, kind of uh, model here for, for us to sort of get into the fray as well. I mean, it's basically like tactical um, mud wrestling and fighting. You know, you hit me, I'm going to hit you, you are hit me, I'm going to hit you. And then we've kind of forgotten what this is all about. Now, admittedly, <clears throat> there were certain issues that we were, you know, trying to deal with in a more strategic sense. <clears throat> there is, of course, the annexation of Crimea. Uh, which was, you know, the first real, um, uh, you know, attack of that nature, you know, by a major European power since World War II. I mean, yes, there was the incursion of uh, Turkey into Cyprus in 1974 in the European uh, space. But, you know, this, this really is on a, you know, a different level about what Russia did um, in terms of annexing Crimea, you know, putting it back into, um, in their view, into the, the Russian Federation and doing this whole kind of reversal um, of, uh, of uh, history here. And then, of course, there's the war in Donbass, there's the intervention in Syria. You know, there's a lot of um, episodes, events, all kinds of things that we can point to. I mean, I could go on, obviously, where, yeah. you know, we all thought we had to have a reaction. But that, again, shouldn't be just the only frame. You know, we have to assess all of these um, issues, you know, on their merits and figure out how we're going to move forward, not be constantly pulled back to the same discussion because at this particular juncture with a pandemic uh, facing um, you know crisis uh, climate crisis I mean this is the first day in DC we've had that hasn't been in the 90s you know for a while although it could be when I step outside again <laughs> you know who knows we, we all know that you know things are happening here that we need to focus on and to address and the more that we're in this tactical mud wrestling fight with Russia the less we can move forward on addressing big issues Give me give me a sense of that. I'm particularly interested in the last few years when it seems like what would have traditionally been the U.S.-Russia agenda, right? We have kind of the, the big bilateral issues of the arms control and regional conflicts and so on, where, you know, we, we have different perspectives for sure, but we found ways to manage those things. And then we have the global challenges of climate and pandemics and terror and trafficking. And, you know, we did counter piracy together. But in the last few years, when so much of that agenda has been crowded out by precisely the difficulty of just communicating, as you've uh, eloquently described it, what's left on the agenda if you were to set it for today? Well, really, I think all that is left at this particular juncture where we could hope for some uh, traction is arms control. Because I think every uh, one of us agrees that this is uh, a necessary endeavor. Um, you know, we have um, arms control treaties that are you know, running out of time in their current format, New START, uh, for example. We've had a lot of questions about, um, you know, um, uh, obviously after uh, the withdrawal um, from INF, um, you know, which had obviously been in place since 1987, and, you know, withdrawal was a result um, of these persistent violations 
uh, by uh, Russia over time that weren't uh, being addressed, what, where do we go next in a much more complex, um, multifaceted nuclear world? You know, at the, um, in 1987, when uh, the INF treaty was uh, concluded um, uh, between Gorbachev and Reagan, it was really just the US and the Soviet Union that had these major arsenals with the capability of um, destroying each other. Since then, so many other countries have come into that space. China is the most obvious one, but of course we've had, you know, some of the other nuclear powers appear, you know, on the horizon over time. You know, we've got uh, Pakistan and India that are constantly on the verge of uh, a nuclear standoff that we're deeply concerned about. Um, you know, we have all the existing, you know, nuclear powers and from the P5 at the UN Security Council where, you know, we've still got issues like the non-proliferation treaty uh, to deal with. There's a, there's a complex set of issues here that we absolutely uh, have to attend to. And I think that we've got off to um, a belated start, but at least, you know, a reasonable start in you know, getting back to the negotiating table, you know, recent discussions in Vienna, but we haven't figured out how to sequence this yet. And we're, you know, we're, we're running against the clock. So I think that's, uh, you know, one area which is on the agenda we really do have to take uh, care of. And I would have hoped that the pandemic would be another, but I think what we've sadly seen is every single country um, has got itself bogged down in its own national response or lack of response you know, to the pandemic. I mean, some have done, you know, extraordinarily well. We've seen our scientific community continue to work together behind the scenes. I mean, unprecedented level of cooperation. And, you know, with countries like Russia, we've done that in the past. I mean, we helped eradicate smallpox with the Soviet Union, even during the Cold War. We helped to deal with polio and the campaign, you know, to push that back, although sadly we haven't eradicated it yet. We know we can do this. But if all we're doing is, you know, taking, you know, tactical hits at each other, and continuing to convince ourselves that we're in you know some confrontation we're not going to get anywhere so i mean the whole goal of policy over the last several years behind the scenes has been how do we stabilize and then professionalize this relationship instead of the guys who just do dirty tricks for a living which you know are always there and are always going to be trying to do this how can we put the guys from the ministry of foreign affairs um or the, you know the professionals from uh, the Ministry of Defense and the Pentagon, you know, back together, have discussions about deconfliction and, you know, all the things that um, we were able to stabilize the relationship in the past. And how can we get the guys in and, um, <clears throat> you know, the various professional groups back to discussing the arms control agenda and how we have, you know, what everyone used to call strategic stability restored. Uh, I mean, this is this is really the perfect segue to do what I promised we would do, which is uh, talk a bit about Putin. You know, when you talk about how do you empower uh, diplomats to talk to each other, how do you empower kind of uh, actual security professionals or, you know, sort of the, the uniformed military, the people who speak the same technical language. Um, on our side, it's implicitly clear that you've got to clear politics out of the way to some degree. Uh, because if everything they say to one another becomes subject to the scrutiny of American politics, they can't say anything. And you know that better than anybody. On the Russian side, there's another problem. And that problem appears to be uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, the image and reputation that he has, the system that he runs. Uh, it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for, any, there's, no, there's no oxygen for anything but Putin and his agenda. How do you understand Ne negotiating with Putin's Russia, or dealing with Putin's Russia versus dealing with Russia as such? Well, I mean, the difficulty that we have that everybody knows, and you've got a lot of people, you know, writing about this very eloquently and, you know, various your know, Canon blogs, <clears throat> um, is the sort of fusion of the security services with the state. Now, if we really think about this in the Soviet period, there were a lot more checks and balances, and there was, you know, a division um, of... Um, uh, I want to say labor, but maybe that's probably not the right, uh, the right way of putting it. But there was, you know, uh, definitely there was the state and then there was, you know, the sort of security services, which were actually, you know, run then on a fairly tight leash. You know, we might have <clears throat> had this image in the Cold War, thanks to Jean Le Carré and all the other, you know, kind of people, uh, you know, writing about this, the sort of James Bond movies of, you know, spies running around all over the place. <clears throat> but these guys were under the oversight of the state. When you get to a, a situation that we've had since 2000, where Putin has come out of the security services, out of the KGB, through the back corridors, and they have become the state, all of these appointments of security officials from the various intelligence agencies, 
in and around Putin in the Kremlin and cabinet and other positions, but also private business and, and everything else. You've got kind of state capture there. So how do you move this into a different phase? Now, it seems that what Putin has been trying to do himself is create a kind of more stable system out of all of this. Um, I don't think he's by any stretch thinking about putting the security services out to pasture or sort of turn them into domesticated you know, animals in some way, in the way of kind of thinking uh, that through. But, you know, he, he's, he's trying to, by all these recent uh, constitutional um, amendments, and Kennan and others have been doing a lot of really uh, great analysis of this, putting the system onto a different footing for the next uh, several, uh, several years. And he's moving himself into this kind of elder statesman, head of state, quasi-constitutional monarch role. Uh, and if he starts to see himself as something other than you know, the title of the book, Operative in the Kremlin, and, you know, the elder statesman, you know, the man who's been in power one way or another for 20 years, he becomes almost the sort of elder statesman of the international community as well. Can he start to have the state think more like a state and less like, you know, this kind of set of tactical operations? And, you know, I mean, my challenge out to, you know, the Kremlin and the Russians would be, okay, show us that you can do that. I mean, if he's really trying to move himself into that different phase, then why are we doing all this still tactical fighting? Because I think they've got themselves into this vicious cycle of, you know, trying to hit us all the time. It's the kind of feeling of, you know, restoring the balance and the kind of getting um, revenge for the sense of grievance that has permeated in Russian politics since the end of the Cold War. But there's limits to that. And if they really do want to achieve things, something that can be a measure of a legacy for Putin in the system, arms control would be part of this, but also stabilizing that relationship and figuring out how to put you know, the Russian state on a different trajectory you know, after the pandemic. I mean, the, the uh, Russian economy is going to flatline. It's going to be affected by everybody else's large recessions. And there has to be a different agenda to move forward. And you know, Putin has to promise something uh, to the population uh, moving forward. Otherwise, his brand is going to get stale again very quickly. I mean, there's already talks about stability turning into stagnation, like a Brezhnev. And, you know, if Putin is in power from 2000 to 2036, it's not just in this competition to see who can be the longest serving, you know, leader, Stalin, Putin, or, you know, any of the czars. But, you know, really, what are you going to do for the country? And that's what he keeps saying. He's going to do something for the country. Well, mud wrestling with the United States from here to perpetuity isn't really doing something for the country. Yeah, this is a fascinating point to me, Fiona, because I think in a way, uh, without even having been asked the question that I am intended to ask, you've squared the circle. The difficulty in Washington is not that there are a group of American thinkers about Russia or about American foreign policy who think Putin's great who are naive about Russia and think it's great that you know the ex-KGB men are running things and have taken over national wealth. Sometimes uh, there's a sort of superficial depiction that that's what the debate is, right? People who sort of get Putin and are clear-eyed and you know, see KGB in his eyes and so forth, and, and people who are naive. In fact, I think most people agree, yeah, it's not a great thing for Russia. It's not a great, certainly not a great thing for the United States that you know, Putin behaves the way he behaves and, and, the, and the KGB has sort of taken over so much of Russia. The principal debate is about what do we do going forward? Do we essentially write off working with that government, dealing with that government, because you cannot trust these people, you morally should not empower them by having any sort of commerce, broadly speaking, with them, uh, or do we have to find a way forward? And, and what I hear you suggesting, tell me if I understand this correctly, is that uh, there are some pathways by which Russia can adjust its behavior to act more like the great power that it wants to be, and then we can deal with them great power to great power. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, the whole quest, um, you know, since 2000 onwards is to get Russia's seat back at the table. You know, we have plenty of people writing about, you know, the whole framing for the Putin presidency about restoring Russia first domestically and you know, restoring the, the power of the state after a period of uh, disorganization and disarray in 1990s. And then, you know, getting Russia back in the mix is a great power with everybody acknowledging that, not just as a regional power, but one with global power projection. I mean, we've seen that that's kind of 
every time you know there's been a comment you know about oh Russia's just interested in Europe they kind of you know move a bit further forward to show that that's actually not the case you know and if we got any you know mistaken um, uh, perceptions after annexation of Crimea and Donbass that they were a regional power focused just on Europe then the intervention in Syria you know shows that of course you know Russia has historic interest in the Middle East you know re uh, invigorating old ties with Venezuela and um, the Western Hemisphere countries Latin and South America uh, Africa you know, Libya you know all of these are things that Russia is showing hey we've still got the ability to project force even if it might be with a lighter footprint because we have enduring interests there, historic interests, you know, you name it, we want to be at the table. Well, to be at the table, and not just in the purview of um, the United Nations table, where Russia is a member, obviously, of the permanent five, but to be on the table on all of these other issues, you have to be at the table, you know, acting as a great power, you know, in a great power conversation, not just kicking the hell out of everybody under the table or being under the table, you know, kind of, you know, trying to pull everybody down. And that was a kind of a point um, that, you know, I and many others, you know, tried to make over this last period that, okay, um, you know, we get it. Um, you know, you thought it was fair game to mess about in 2016 and a lot of it is on us, you know, about, you know, the way we reacted to it, things that were going on in our own uh, politics. But if we want to move forward and, you know, act together as great powers and having this big power conversation, let's just stop all of this messing about. Let's get real. You know, so if there's more of these, you know, um, interventions and just messing about in 2020, we're not going to be able to do that. So it's, let's get past the tactical games. And if you want to have a strategic conversation, let's have it. You know, and part of the problem is, of course, our domestic politics, the way that we've been dealing with all of this. And then also that just the temptation that seems overwhelming at times to people in the services at Russia to just kind of keep, you know, keep on hitting us. You know, so there's at some point there's got to be somebody saying, OK, let's just stop this, restrain ourselves and see where we get. I suspect they're not really going to do that until, you know, we get past November and into January and they see where things are headed. But we, at least here in the US, can start to try, you know, various levels where it makes sense to have a sensible conversation about, you know, how do we deal with this? Where do we want this, um, you know, kind of relationship to go? Acknowledging, you know, the much larger complexity of global affairs at this moment. Yeah, this is this is great. And we have, as you might imagine, a lot of questions coming in. So what I'm going to try to do with our time remaining is kind of integrate as many of those questions into our conversation as we can. Um, and if you can respond to them in a relatively compact way, I think we can get a fair number. But uh, I apologize to everyone now. We're not going to get anywhere near everybody. Um, I want to start with one that I think is directly on the point that you made about, uh, you know, <laughs> a potential way forward in the next few years um, if Russia can begin to act as a state. Uh, Sir John Scarlett, former head of MI6, uh, the chair of the co-chair of the Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council, um, asks essentially whether uh, Putin's having uh, you know, prevailed in this referendum is a boost to his confidence that maybe permits him to do the kinds of things you're talking about. Uh, or uh, is it actually a, a sign of weakness and insecurity, and in which case, uh, you know, we wouldn't be so hopeful about the future? And he, and he adds, I, I think the, the two go together. Um, it, it may be that he could be an elder statesman, uh, but if he continues to be obsessed with the United States and the West and uh, looking for opportunities to uh, undermine uh, us, doesn't that reflect that he just won't have the mindset to, to be that? I'm muted myself. Unmute. Sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that actually, I can I can shorten my response to this because I think you know that uh, Sir John actually you know answered part of that at the end, and I think that that makes the point very clearly that if this retains uh, this uh, obsession uh, with the United States as an adversary continuously in the sort of kind of a frame of a geopolitical struggle, no matter where it may be, then we're not really going to get anywhere, you know, and opening up another front in Venezuela or a new front in Libya or, you know, where in fact, uh, in, in many cases, sometimes our interests actually align in terms of wanting to stabilize um, these, um, you know, particular um, regions. Um, but always, you know, seeing that if we're there, 
they have to be there and there's you know some kind of clash uh, that is inevitable i mean that's not really going to get us anywhere i do think that the effort to um you know put in place the uh, amendments um came from uh, both a kind of a mixture of anxiety and uh and confidence i mean most things are you know not that black and white in any case i think there was anxiety that as you got closer to 2024 and the um the end of the current set of terms that putin was increasingly seen as a lame duck everyone's expecting him to leave you know, there's all the talk about the anniversary of, um, you know, Lenin and, you know, his uh, demise, you know, was he going to get carried out in a box? Is he going to die in office? Is he going to be able to do what Yeltsin did and, you know, create a su uh, successor, operation successor? Is this underway? Can I be the successor? That might have been the, you know, the various thinking of people around him. And I think he wanted to put that off uh, and uh, just give the system a bit more time because it was... Uh, questions about you know how the international environment was going to take shape over um, this period. Now I think there was confidence at the time when they announced these amendments that you know the US was somewhat preoccupied spinning on its own axle. You know China isn't likely to inter interfere given you know all the things that are kind of going on in, in China and the fact that they've got a reasonably good relationship with China and Europe's got you know Brexit to contend with and all kinds of other things going on that they had a breathing space to push things through to stabilize the situation, to then make the big decisions and put them off. I mean, the risk of course is that the um, situation becomes more and more unpredictable and a lot of people will be looking to Putin still to keep signaling where's this all headed. And, you know, as Sir John said, if it's all just headed into just perpetual cycles of confrontation with the US, that's just not gonna be very helpful. And then no. the other thing is, how are you going to refresh, you know, the, the country, the brand, the Putin brand and the system for you know the rest of the 2020s you know with a pandemic a global recession and you know one of the biggest crises in a century where are your fresh ideas and i think that that's they should be focusing on that yeah so i have to i have to push a little more on that question i mean look you you literally wrote the book mr putin um there are these different uh kind of lenses on putin in the book in the form of chapters like you know i love putin the history man because of course we've literally just see him seen him you know, attempt to be a professor of history and, you know, write his version of the World War II history. So I think it's very prescient, very accurate uh, study of the man. Um, but I don't come away from that book uh, with the impression that this is a guy who can change, uh, and, and certainly not in fundamental ways, especially given the importance of the formative early life and kind of professional early life KGB stuff that you talk about. Is it realistic to talk about a Putin who can abandon a kind of lifelong obsession with confrontation with the United States? Yeah, I think, look, um, fundamental change is difficult for everybody. And it's, you know, not something that, you know, we, we normally see, uh, but you can adapt. And, you know, I, I did, um, you know, sort of see uh, towards the end of the book and looking back on the first version of it, that Putin did learn lessons, you know, from the past now. You know, and then he adapts his behavior towards them. Does that mean fundamental change? you know, perhaps not, but, you know, people evolve and the situations evolve and you adapt to them. And he's a planner and he's always got contingencies. Now, I think also, um, you know, the risk is that they're fresh out of new ideas. And, you know, I think there's an awful lot of people writing about this right now that there's not a kind of a sense of where they're heading. And, you know, we're all in this predicament now. We are going to be in a fundamentally changed environment for all of us if we ever get to the end of this pandemic any time in the next couple of years. And if this goes on for a lot longer, I mean, we're all going to have to see fundamental change in the way that we, uh, we, we do things. We're already doing it now. I mean, who thought we would be doing this, you know, by Zoom? So, I mean, there's all kinds of, and we're adapting to that, but we, we have not yet given up on the idea. You said it at the very beginning of meeting again in person. So, I mean, we haven't fully fundamentally changed the way we do things either. So this is all going to be a process. But I, I do think, I mean, again, that, I mean, there's a challenge down uh, to the Russians. There's got to be. We should, we should, you know, make it from within our own system. If we start to seriously think about how can we change and alter the trajectory of where, you know, we've got stuck into this, you know, kind of perpetual vicious cycle of just, you know, tactical confrontation with Russia, are they capable of moving forward too, or are they just stuck still in that idea of the lone wolf geopolitical competition? You know, Russia was a great power and not, you know, kind of seeing any room for cooperation or, you know, kind of um, any other way of doing things or doing business other than, you know, what they know what they've been doing for, you know, decades now. So perhaps a, a kind of uh, other side of the coin from uh, a pattern of dysfunction to a possible future 
that looks a little better would be maybe where we're going now with China, right? Where we have a very business-like pattern of talking to them, dealing with them, working out our disagreements because it's in everybody's interest to do so. Um, but if you look at the last several months, my impression is we're, we're getting into this kind of tactical tit for tat confrontation. And, and for you especially, the, the closure of the consulate, I imagine, must have brought back memories of uh, 2018, the tit for tat closures and expulsions and so forth. What's your sense overall of how kind of the U.S. confrontation that's emerging now with China uh, can benefit from lessons uh, from, you know, the U.S.-Russia relationship, but also uh, how that triangle plays out since, of course, no one's standing still in this, in this complicated world. Yeah, the Russians, um, you know, certainly don't want to find themselves sort of pulled over into some uh, opposing China bloc. <clears throat> you know, and on that front, you know, the idea of having a sort of a G7 focused on China and inviting Russia along with um, uh, South Korea, Australia, you know, India, others, um, I, you know, I don't think is a starter you know, from the Russian point of view. So, you know, what we see, what you know, and what everybody else, you know, listening to this knows, you know, who's been working on Russia and looking at the Russia-China relationship is that the Russians just do not want, for their point of view, to sort of see some kind of repetition of a, you know, kind of a, a massive opposing set of blocks with China and then, you know, kind of, you know, pulled over certainly to one side. Now, you know, would they like to try to play you know, among the, uh, between the scenes, uh, seems rather, you know, offering Japan and other countries, for example, you know, their good offices with China to, you know, kind of reshape um, some of the interactions in certain arenas, like in the Asia Pacific, for example, you know, sure, I do think they've got very worried by India-China standoff. Um, it's really very interesting, because I haven't seen a lot um, you know, kind of said by the Russians on this one, but that must be giving them some heartburn because of course, you know, that old territorial dispute that they thought they'd resolved with uh, China along the Amur, you know, if circumstances change, who knows, you know, who would have expected China to, you know, um, have such a bloody, uh, you know, confrontation with India and, you know, kill Indian soldiers along the Wakhan corridor. You know, I think that that's kind of given pause for thought. But if you then, you know, kind of extrapolate from that, you know, from our own, you know, purposes, just as you're suggesting, looking back over the Cold War period and, you know, figuring out how we manage the relationship with China, you know, moving forward. There are so many things that we need to interact with China on. I mean, the pandemic just has framed all of that, obviously, um, avoiding um, military confrontation in the South China Seas, the Indo-Pacific uh, region, and it seems to be imperative because it can't lead to anything uh, positive for anyone figuring out how to factor China into arms control and how to get a handle on uh, climate change. I mean, China is a major factor on all of these um, issues. You know, we've, we've got to think about this very carefully. And that then, you know, does lead into you know, what I've been stressing again, is how do we emphasize diplomacy and interactions? Obviously, um, closing down concepts of they're being used for espionage, you know, for intelligence operations, uh, that makes an awful lot of sense. But the point is always to go back to get to value on diplomacy. Diplomacy is a tool, it's an instrument. It's not a reward for good behavior. It's what we should be doing. And, you know, that's uh, getting to your point with Russia, you know, where, you know, we've got ourselves into a bind. We have reduced down the number of contacts. We can't have these sensible conversations. We need our intel services to be talking to each other as professionals. We need our militaries to be talking to each other at all kinds of levels and not just, you know, having insults being um, hurled. I mean, we've had, you know, good set of relations um, with our chairmen, you know, and, and we've got a lot of deconfliction going on. We have Ambassador Jeffrey and his team, you know, running around on Syria, you know, actually having sensible discussions um, with Russian counterparts. We had the recent meetings in uh, Vienna with Marshall Billingsley and uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Rebkov and others. We know we can do this, but we have to uh, create uh, the framework again. And it can't be done while Russia is still part of our domestic politics and everybody's screaming about it. And similar with China, we have to make sure very much that China doesn't become some kind of partisan issue in our politics. National security issues should not be partisan. They should not be politicized because they affect all of us and you know the risks of uh, something getting out of, out of control are far too high and yeah. so we need to kind of sh give our system a shock again uh, to realize that we have to take this out of this political partisan domain and you know think about it sensible level and if we can't do it on the congressional and senate level right now 
think tanks, you know, other entities, you know, at least, you know, we can have some kind of discussion on, you know, the contours, which I don't think are mysterious to anyone. I think, you know, we'd all be generally on the same page. I mean, we want to deter Russia from, you know, doing the things that it's been doing, but we do want to find a different frame for uh, our interactions. Yeah, no, I think your your line, national security issues uh, should not be partisan and should not be politicized, really ought to be inscribed in the marble of uh, many think tank uh, entry halls. Um, certainly, we welcome that at the Wilson Center. Uh, I want to try to get in as many of these questions as I, as I can. So I'm just going to read some of them, Fiona, if you don't mind, and, and ask for your quick take. Um, Jennifer Hansler from CNN uh, asks, uh, can you reflect on how Putin will see the U.S. announcement of a drawdown of troops in Germany and how he might use or respond to that? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of this, um, the Germany, the troops, the whole kind of question about what, um, you know, NATO's posture um, is going to be is uh, clearly um, a, a preoccupation for Putin and others. I mean, for their military planners, um, uh, among um, uh, you know the kind of the main uh, protagonists there, clearly they're looking to see how serious we are about ensuring European security in the way that we have been up until now. I mean, we uh, forward deployed a number of troops in response to what Russia did in Ukraine uh, with Crimea and Donbass, and you know so also after the intervention in Syria to deter further uh, incursions of this kind. Or, and, and certainly to um, make it very clear that there would be a tripwire, you know, of a substantial nature if Russia contemplated any um, major military uh, operation in the Baltic states or, you know, any of the kind of fragile neighboring countries. I mean, I think we're also, you know, have to be um, aware that um, troops are not the only solution. It's really coordinated, concerted action with our allies because you know, it's, it's really the operations that fall short of these kind of full scale military um, incursions that we have to be most worried about. The use of cutouts and proxies, um, the um, PMCs, the paramilitary, you know, groups uh, that, um, that they've been using, Wagner, you know, and others that we've seen in Syria and, um, uh, you know, around in, in Africa as well. Uh, we have to basically push back against all of that kind of activity. Um, and we can't just do it by, you know, moving troops around. We have to do it in full concert with all of the allies and recognizing that, um, you know, the, 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 the Russians are going to keep probing and trying to kind of uh, test how willing we are to maintain the existing defenses and how willing we are to push back. But there's all kinds of different ways of pushing back. I mean, a lot of it will depend on, you know, whether this has just come rotation, uh, whether, you know, uh, troops are moved um, elsewhere and what else we're doing beyond, you know, kind of moving, you know, men in uniform and equipment around. Right. Uh, let me ask another from uh, Tracy Wilkinson of the Los Angeles Times uh, is asking, knowing what you know about Putin, do you anticipate an October surprise uh, either to help Putin cement his gains during the Trump era to help Trump's reelection or simply to sow more chaos in the U.S. So presumably some some interference in the election is what he has. Well, sowing chaos has been really the goal of all of this. I mean, to really give um, most Americans pause uh, about um, the strength of their democracy and to kind of you know um, uh, weaken our confidence in our own systems. And you know that's kind of been a hallmark of um, Russian and Soviet um, active measures uh, for decades. Um, you know, we've seen this on, you know, kind of a, a long time scale. And, you know, I think we've got a whole bunch of books that are out there right now that, you know, I can yeah. you know, recommend, uh, you know, on, on this kind of topic where we can kind of really see this in action over a long sweep of history. So we have to put this in context. So, you know, if, 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 if Russia and, and Putin and others think that there is more to be gained by weakening the United States, by sowing discord and having people fight about electoral outcomes, then yes, we'll see that. But if we, you know, can uh, get the message across that there's more to be gained that from trying to stabilize a relationship and stop all of this, restrain ourselves from doing it, you know, then, you know, we're not likely to see things on the same scale. Right now, I think, you know, that they're just seeing too much to be gained from this. And so a lot of it is just our own posture and our own willingness, you know, to deal with this head on and to fix our own, um, you know, house. Because, you know, the, the, it's much more difficult for them to have 
any kind of leverage if we have like mass voter turnout, for example, and if we're having, you know, much more civil discourse in our own politics, and we're not in this partisan warfare, because, you know, they take advantage of when we see red and blue as enemies, and we've divided, you know, the US into opposing camps, rather than thinking of ourselves on a shared endeavor. So I want to I want to jump on that point very quickly because I think there's a bit of a a, a trap. There's a, a kind of perverse incentive that happens when we pay a lot of attention. Sometimes motivated by partisanship, other times uh, just objective factors. It's interesting. It's important. Someone needs to do the work. Uh, but we end up kind of reducing Russia questions to questions of where Russia is doing nefarious things to us. And so you get these sort of depictions of Putin and Russia as not even just Darth Vader, but now increasingly, you know, stuff that almost has, um, you know, sort of Russophobic overtones and, and things like that. Um, that, in a sense, actually, it seems to me, almost deepens the vulnerability that you're talking about. If we build them up to be these scary, dark forces who can do anything at any time, that actually gives them even more ammunition. So how do you assess the balance between, on the one hand, uh, you know, sort of staying measured and balanced and calm and keeping partisan politics out of it, but on the other on the other hand, being acutely aware of what's going on. We have to be able to assess, um, you know, why Russia is doing this in the first place or why Putin may think like this. I mean, that was one of the reasons for writing the book. And obviously, you know, that's at the root of a lot of the fellowship, um, uh, you know, fellowships and programs and you know, kind of sponsored research that, you know, you have at the Kennan Institute and Woodrow Wilson and all of the think tanks and universities. We're trying to undercover, uncover rather, the, the deeper motivations and drivers. I mean, we're constantly talking about the drivers of foreign policy from our own domestic policy, similar with Russia. You know, people talk about that idea of strategic empathy, you know, figuring out what it is that makes the Russians tick. And, and, and trying to understand that doesn't mean you're appeasing them in any way. It means that, you know, you're trying to understand why they're doing this. And then you have to deal with that head on, you know, kind of. So if they perceive a security threat here, why do they, you know, how can we think about this? How is it that they act in response to a security threat? Because, you know, in my experience, what the Russians do is they try to preempt it. You know, they look at what capability and capacity we have for action and they try to head it off, even if our intent was never there to do something. And so we have to understand all of that. And as you say, not get trapped into kind of, you know, thinking that everything is just framed by, you know, the activities of, you know, various entities um, that are, you know, may or may not be run directly by the um, Russian intelligence services. And we have fallen in a trap into the media as well by being obsessed with all of this. Yes. Uh, and, and it is constant articles about it rather than, you know, looking at some of, um, you know, the, the deeper issues. Now, that doesn't always make for good copy and it becomes confusing and convoluted. It's much easier to, you know, kind of come up with some simplistic explanation. But we have to have a hard look at this. We've got a much more robust and in-depth reporting on China. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm reading on China in the papers is extremely interesting. And people are trying to delve into this and much, it seems a deeper understanding, ironically, of, uh, of China, you know, now than, than of Russia. Uh, of Russia, you know, being um, a country that we've been interacting with for an extraordinary long period of time and China only rather recently coming to the forefront as a, as a major interlocutor, although certainly an economic interlocutor for um, a, a period of time. But you know, we ought to have that same approach to Russia as we do with China. Now, I, I'll yeah. admit it too, there's a lot of anxiety about China, but there's also a lot of very sensible you know, discussions and um, books being written about China that are not filled with this kind of heavy breathing and you know, semi-hysteria that we often get about Russia. Yeah, and there's no question that, that Putin is a big part of that, the, the mystique that attaches to him. There's even a book called The Putin Mystique. Um, you know, I heard a report on the radio the other day that was all about uh, some kind of, you know, uh, new social media influencer technology. And it was a very interesting kind of on the ground story about how this works in a, a, a Chinese city of several million people that I had not even ever heard of. You know, and China's full of these wonderful stories. But the really interesting thing to me about that story about that report was that the entire report uh, went through without any mention of Xi Jinping or the Chinese Communist Party. And you can't picture a comparable story about something ha happening in Russia's regions somewhere that's interesting or important, whether it's fires, whether it's protests, whether it's something in business or energy, without talk about Putin and the Kremlin. Uh, and I think it would be inaccurate to say that's because Russia somehow is more authoritarian than China. They're both authoritarian. They both have power verticals. Um, so I agree with that, but can I use this to pivot in the limited time we have left 
to some Putin questions, because we've gotten a lot of Putin questions. Like you said, they're good copy. We advertise this as a Putin conversation, and you wrote the book. So you had to have been expecting them. Um, Ambassador Bill Hill, whom we both know uh, from the uh, a Kennan Institute Global Fellow, Kennan Advisory Council member, asks, uh, Fiona, you've met Putin many times prior to 2017, but uh, during your service on the NSC, did you see anything to change your evaluation of him uh, or any changes in Putin over that time uh, that became evident in his meetings with U.S. representatives or his calls with President Trump, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in some respects, um, I mean, what you see is somebody who's grown much more comfortable in, you know, the kind of the position that he's been in. I mean, part of the obsession about Putin and, you know, part of, um, you know, the explanation for what you've just kind of laid out there, Matt, is that he has very consciously gone out there to create a number of personas. You know, Masha Gessen's book, you know, The Man Without a Face, Putin has decided to put many faces on. He's been something for everybody. And that was kind of, you know, what Cliff and I were trying to bring out in the Putin book uh, that we wrote, was that he's somebody who has spent a lot of time thinking about him, his image and his brand and, you know, how he's going to present himself, you know, be it bare-chested, riding around on horses. We haven't seen Xi Jinping doing that. You know, I mean, this is a very studied, you know, um, uh, uh, role for Putin. Every single one of those appearances in all these different guises has been deliberate to make um, uh, you know connection to a domestic constituency or just to be signaling you know his vigor and activeness to you know the rest of the world hey don't mess with me kind of thing so um, you know we've we've got to you know kind of a, a situation now where the guy's been in power for so long he's become very comfortable in the role and he's in something of a bubble. I mean, I don't want to say that he's lost his edge because, I mean, he's an edgy guy in, in terms of, you know, the things that he can do abroad. But I do think he's kind of lost a little bit of the feel of what's going on domestically. And that is inevitable. Inevitable. Any leader who, you know, is in a country for a, a very long period of time loses touch, you know, with what's happening across the country or any political party. I mean, you know, this is what we've seen here in the United States. The traditional parties have got complacent, you know, kind of in, uh, comfortable in, you know, their various stances and, you know, completely missed a lot of trends that uh, were happening on uh, racial um, inequality, you know, all kinds of uh, issues that, um, you know, come to the fore in more recent times that were kind of ignored or just, you know, kind of dismissed. I think Putin, you know, runs that same risk. You know, I, I did think that in some of the interactions, although he's still extremely well prepared, some of them he's just kind of going through the motions. And some of it was kind of a slightly, you know, kind of lazy response to a few things here and there, just, you know, kind of still going over old tropes or old formats. But, you know, this is still a guy who really prepares and, you know, is kind of always trying to be one step ahead. And also he has a great advantage now that, you know, the system and people around him, they've all worked together for so long. You know, our disadvantage in the time of interacting was we kept changing players all the time, you know, leaving only the kind of the relationship at the top intact and every other, you know, level of interlocutor, you know, kind of falling by the wayside, which gives Putin an incredible advantage. And so, um, you know, you can, you know, and then you can see that actually also adds in, I think, to the kind of a little bit of a sense of the sort of laziness about it. He doesn't really have to try so hard. And I do think that, you know, he's probably become kind of complacent and thinking that, you know, kind of on the international front, everything that he's been doing has been working. And so, again, it becomes less of an incentive to do something differently. Although domestically with the, you know, the um, um, protests in Habarovsk and elsewhere, it's showing that he has to keep on his toes. He is going to be forced, you know, like everybody else is inevitably to um, reckon with the fact that the country's changing underneath him. And while he might not have fundamentally changed, he might have adapted, he's adapted in this bubble. It's not like he's out and about like every man, you know, in all kinds of different corners and the amount of information coming into him, you know, good question about how, how accurate it is or, you know, how much it really gets a kind of a feel for what's actually happening. That, that's actually a great uh, segue because we have a number of questions about kind of Putin's notion of Russian nationalism, right? Is he a nationalist? Uh, what does Russian patriotism mean for him? It sounds to me like you're saying for him, it's, it's a bit frozen. Them, right, it's it's something that was formed by a set of experiences, you know, World War II memory, 1970s, what have you, uh, resentment after the 90s. But it's kind of stuck, and he's not adapting to Russia today. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, there is some kind of aspects of this which are worth bearing in mind. You know, where he, um, you know, goes after everybody's weaknesses and cleavages and divisions, be they racial, ethnic, religious, you know, kind of, um, you know, you name it. 
he's very careful about that at home. And that is also a memory from the 1990s, of course, from the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of the interethnic conflict that emerged, um, not just in Russia itself, with Chechnya or, you know, kind of the risks of it in places like Tatarstan and elsewhere, um, the rise of, you know, Islamist uh, movements, um, you know, but also what happened on the periphery um, and all the kind of civil wars in places like Tajikistan or, you know, the kind of outbreaks of conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. You know, Putin has been very uh, careful to create a big tent sense of Russian nationalism. It's a sort of an imperial nationalism. You know, we talked about it as Rasiski rather than Ruski, although, you know, meaning the differentiation between a kind of a Russian state -like, um identity, uh, which can be multifaceted, multi-confessional, multi-ethnic, mm -hmm. and something that's narrowly Russian ethnic uh, and Russian Orthodox. And, and yet, if I can point out that, the, that, was the, that line, you know, very finely. But the constitutional amendments have just now brought a huge element of traditional Ruski Russianness, the language, the, the, the religion, God, everything. Uh, into yeah, that's what I was actually going to, I was going to segue into that because I was saying that that also shows that he thinks that, you know, kind of that has all been consolidated by now. And I think that that's a risk. Because the way that he played from the 90s onwards for the first, you know, 20 odd years was trying to seal, you know, kind of those divisions again. And now he's falling into the temptation, you know, that others have before, gets to my point about being a bit complacent and thinking that that is a kind of a rock solid base. I mean, we see this happening all over the place where, you know, there's a kind of a sense of consolidating around, you know, one major set of identities. And he really runs the risk there of opening up again, rifts that are still there, you know, behind the scenes. I mean, he's, he's always trying to be very careful about playing with, um, you know, Kadira from the Chechen and, you know, Muslim um, uh, peoples of the Russian Federation who of course have a long history, just as long as the history of uh, Russian Orthodoxy. He always um, emphasizes the indigenous um, religions of Russia not just orthodoxy, but Islam, Judaism, and Buddhism, you know, but you can see he's getting into, you know, dimensions of what might seem trivial and almost humorous to others of fighting with shamanism and, you know, other, you know, fringe uh, groups, but that's all very dangerous. And he really, you know, does know better than that, but he's obviously fairly confident that he can kind of pander, you know, right now to this larger base. And I worry about that. I worry that that is a, again, um, a failure to see how things have evolved and of course they do an awful lot of polling you know but people don't as we all know always give their full views um in um all of uh, all of this polling so i think he ought to tread a little bit more carefully i mean i think the the fairly viewpoint is this sort of like popular nationalist sentiment has been on the ascendancy you know across europe or you know globally you know here in the us as well but you know i think a lot of development shows that um this may be otherwise and uh, if I were them, I wouldn't have, you know, tried to put all of that into the constitution, but maybe things in amending it once you can kind of amend it again. It's just trying to, you know, consolidate everything that they've been doing for the last 20 years. So in our final two minutes, Fiona, um, and, and I just have to apologize to all of the wonderful questioners whose questions I won't reach and people whose questions I stole without attributing to their names. I like to do that too. <laughs> Um, but I, I can't not ask you this at the end. When, when Vladimir Putin looks at the 2020 U.S. election, how does he size up these two alternative American futures? And what would be your advice to whoever takes the office, the oath of office in January of 2021, as to how to deal with this guy? Well, I mean, Putin's looking to see what he can get out of it, no matter who it is. I mean, clearly he wants to have um, a weaker U.S. president, doesn't matter who. Um, and you know he'll be looking to see if that's the kind of the case because the more that the U.S. is um, bogged down in its own inter internal contradictions, and the weaker the president is domestically but also perceived internationally, the less likely it is for the U.S. to try to restore a leadership role insofar as that might be a leadership of some, you know, kind of common cause against Russia. I mean, everything is always through that prism of, you know, what does this mean for us rather than you know, kind of a sort of a larger sense of, you know, uh, all being in this together in the series of problems that we've got to contend with. So he's not going to be looking at it through some common good altruistic frame, that's for sure. He's going to look at it as more of like what's in it for us or what could be against um, us in, in, in this outcome. So I think, you know, he wants to basically have a fairly diminished 
you know, US president, no matter who it is, and, you know, kind of a, a US um, a body politic that's all, you know, kind of wound around its own axle and is not, you know, kind of projecting anything out against um, uh, Russia. They certainly don't want more sanctions. Um, they're going to try to kind of feed the divisions, you know, among, not just at, at home in the US, but uh, among the US and its allies to make sure to head those off. And that actually leads to what I would, you know, kind of advise, you know, whoever is going to be um, the president after uh, January um, and, you know, the, um, the new administration is take a serious look at Russia, try to get it out of our domestic politics. And obviously it's going to be difficult, you know, given the current configuration, of the way things are with, you know, um, anyway, we all know what we're talking about here. But um, then start to think about how we work with our allies, because my experience is it's only when we've had a unified, coherent front, you know, with everybody else, not necessarily because Russia is a threat, but as a, as, a, as a problem that we have to deal with and to manage, that we've actually managed to make some headway. And it, it doesn't um, all involve obviously just moving troops around and, you know, there are the diplomacy is pretty uh, key here. You know, it's how we conceive of reforming our own institutions, how we think about our relationships with other key players, you know, we have to um, be on the same page. And that's really the only solution that we have to dealing with China too. And the one thing that we do have to be mindful of is not keep pushing China and Russia together. Because, you know, the reason that the China-Russia relationship looks more robust than, you know, perhaps many of us would anticipated looking at it a few years ago is because we have been pushing the two of them together with our own policy. So we have to think very carefully about how we handle that as well. No question. Uh, there's a tremendous amount in there, but all of which I agree with, and every element of which probably requires quite a lot of follow-up. Um, and in particular, now that Putin has extended his possibility to stay in office until 2036, I think uh, I'm among many people who hope you'll do yet another edition of Mr. Putin uh, with insights about the recent past and the future. But whatever you write, whatever you say, Fiona, we'll be paying close attention. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, and my apologies to the many, many great questioners I didn't get to. Um, see you next time. Thanks very much, Matt. And best wishes to everybody out there as well. Thank you.